it became apparent that the airplane, uh, there was something wrong. If we look at the fuel flow data to the engines, it looked okay, it looked on, on speed. You know, right at any given time, we could see that he's burning eight gallons an hour, for example. That was good data, and it was favorable. But if we look at what was supposed to be our way of determining how much fuel there was in the engine, or in the airplane, and that was, as we pumped it into this header tank, we measured it going in. And then we knew how much was in the header tank, so by measuring how much we took out of each tank, we knew how much was in each tank and therefore knew how heavy the airplane was, how much fuel it had. Those numbers didn't agree. Those numbers said, we got a problem, we're using too much fuel. It was alarming information. It threatened the success of the flight. And it also caused some hard feelings between Bert and Dick Rutan. Dick was flying f higher than he should have. He was flying uh, uh, he was going around weather. He even turned back once. He circled once, and, and he had to richen the engines, and he ran the, he, he ran the, the front engine much longer than we thought was going to be needed. And we were thinking that he was flying the airplane sloppy and using too much fuel. That kind of opinion wasn't calculated to keep Dick calm and contented. With the crew becoming more and more fatigued, discretion was essential. There were times during the flight in which it was deemed by the doctor and by everyone else, talk to them. We've got to be talked to. They're, they're, uh, they're bored to where, they're, to where they need someone to talk to. They need emotional support. They need encouragement. Get on the radio. Everybody get in there and talk to them. There were other times during the flight when the word was they're extremely irritable. Don't talk to them. I think mean, one of the most constructive things we did was keep Bert off the radio because he, he would he may immediately become very technical and very logical or whatever and it just wasn't a time for that. And he and Dick would start fighting so after a while we took him in the office and kind of pounded on him and stay away, go home, do whatever, right. but stay off the radio. Approaching the Philippines, a major problem occurred. The autopilot, essential to the Voyager's flyability, failed. Gina had to work her way under the instrument panel to wire in the backup system while Dick continued to fly the airplane. That was one problem fixed, but the fuel consumption question remained. We studied the data uh, of the fuel flow indication and we studied the fuel system and what was interesting was simultaneously on board the airplane and on the ground we both figured out what was possibly happening there and then Dick saw the bubbles running backwards very slowly in the fuel line and sure enough we were sending fuel back to the fuel tanks that was not being measured now, wonderful news. We've got more fuel than we think we do. Bad news. Nobody knew how much. <laughs> but that was the least of Dick and Gina's worries. They had reached one of the most critical stages of the journey. They were five days into the flight. The front engine was shut down and Gina was at the controls. They were approaching Africa. Since the beginning of the flight, their weather expert Len Snellman had been saying that Africa's weather would be impassable. And at the point the Voyager was crossing, there was political turmoil on the ground. There was a real possibility of a SAM missile or a stray bullet bringing the journey to an end. And then the climb began. For most of the journey, Voyager had been flying at about 10,000 feet. Now they were forced to double that altitude to avoid the high mountains in front of them. Back in Mojave, the weather people watched great storms forming in the Rift Valley and passed on directions for avoiding them. But Dick took his own direct route across the north side of Lake Victoria, trying to avoid the storm clouds. They climbed to 20,000 feet, and at one point, Gina passed out from lack of oxygen. 
Dick thought she was dead. He began to have hallucinations of his own. To gain altitude, they'd had to restart the front engine. With two engines running, the noise was deafening. The electronic noise cancellation system had failed early in the flight, and the only things that saved them from permanent hearing loss were the form-fitting headphones that blocked out the worst of the sound waves. Africa was a nightmare, but once past the mountains, they began to descend, and as they crossed the coastline and headed out into the Atlantic, the hard-nosed Dick Rutan found himself weeping. But after six days of constant noise, lack of sleep, equipment failure, and confinement in a space the size of a phone booth, they were still only two-thirds of the way around the world. And then the weather struck. They were in the middle of a thunderstorm. It took hold of the Voyager and began to roll it over. There was nothing Dick or Gina could do. Then suddenly, they were through the storm, and Dick had to use all his fighter pilot skill to bring the Voyager back to straight and level flight. There'd been some bad moments for Dick during the flight. At high altitude over Africa, he'd hallucinated that the instrument panel was bulging, about to explode outwards. Now off the coast of South America, extreme fatigue drove him to his lowest point. He could no longer recognize the instruments. Gina took over. After three hours sleep, Dick was okay, and he was back in the seat when the next disaster struck. Flying up the Mexican coast, a fuel pump failed. When the back engine quit, you know, the last night out, and the airplane started to go down, uh, we stopped being able to communicate with them. And I remember I was talking on a microphone, and uh, they disappeared, and I thought, well, that's it, I'm not going to see them again. And I knew all he had to do was pull the nose up, and fuel would flow back to the engine, and he knew he had to keep the nose down to keep the speed, the wind blowing the propeller around. So it was a real conflict, and we argued a little bit about that. And then when the front engine started, he immediately pulled the nose up, and the back engine started, and then they started coming back. Now they needed just 28 gallons of fuel to fly home. But to get it, they had to replumb the fuel pumps. Gina got the tools together and cleared the space for Dick to make the switch. He was worried that there might be some stray fuel lying around and a spark could ignite it. There was a maze of plastic tubing and Gina held a flashlight while Dick moved a line from one pump to another. But when they finished, it didn't work. Then they remembered another valve. They changed it and fuel started to flow again. We finally got down to where we had enough fuel in the header tank to know that we could make it back to Edwards. Just enough. We were sucking little bits of fuel out of where we could find them, bringing the level up to that magic 13 gallons that we needed in the header tank to get home. And as soon as that happened, enormous relief, the airplane was gonna make it. Bert Rutan and Mike Melville flew out in the dark morning to meet the Voyager and welcome it home. We made a turn and we looked over there and we saw a flashing beacon. And we said, we think that's you. Turn off your, your beacon light. And they did, and it went off. So now turn it back on. And for some reason, we just all broke down in tears. It was really something. It was really something. Well, Showman Dick showed up at the last time after all this of being exhausted and what they'd been through. Here comes Showman Dick with the velvet arm he has to do a low pass, and then he has to do another one, and we're going, come on, Dick, land it. Just get on the ground. Forget it. That's you right. Know? I think the program could not have been successful without two people like Dick and Gina. In spite of the fact that they didn't get along, you know, in their love affair collapsed. Uh, professionally, they did very well. You know, they, they really were a good support team for each other. You know, I th I'd like to have... Uh, dreams that maybe I could have done a flight like that, but I believe I'm as good a pilot, but I'm not, I don't have the determination. And I think that 
I doubt that Dick even has the full determination. I think it was Gina that had the absolutely unstoppable determination that she was going to do this thing and she didn't care if she died trying. That was what she was going to do. And I really believe that's why they succeeded. The Voyager and its crew had made it around the world unrefueled. No one had even come close before. Dick and Gina went their separate ways, and the Voyager was presented to the National Air and Space Museum.